It was one of the most traumatic events in American history. The murder of John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States, on the streets of Dallas on November 22, 1963. If the presidency of the United States is being decided by bullets fired from rifles rather than ballots cast by citizens, we have indeed been taken over by a whole new form of government. A growing majority of Americans refuse to accept the official version of events, that a lone assassin murdered their president. Those of us who want the truth, want to really learn what happened here, keep asking these questions because it tells a lot about ourselves, about our values, and ultimately the direction of our country. New information about Kennedy's murder continues to emerge, confirming that the truth has been withheld from the American people. We're very lucky that there at least are people who individually have now convinced the vast majority against the mainstream media that the Warren Commission got it wrong. From his hometown of Duluth in Minnesota, one of those questioning critics of the official version of events is Professor James Fetzer. The resurgence of interest in the death of JFK had repercussions when Congress passed the JFK Records Act in 1992 that created a five civilian member board entrusted with the responsibility to review and declassify documents that were held by the CIA, the Secret Service, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and so forth. We know from its own report that it had some significant failures. For example, and the Secret Service, which deliberately destroyed motorcade records that would have revealed that the motorcade in Dallas was a travesty, a violation of at least 15 different Secret Service policies for presidential protection. This behavior on their part raises the most serious and disturbing questions about their complicity in the entire affair. From the moment he arrived in Dallas, the president's protection was suspect, according to Vince Palomara, a Secret Service expert. There was last minute changes invoked by the Secret Service involving President Kennedy's security. Specifically, agents were told not to ride on or near the rear of the limousine. Now these orders were funneled from the assistant special agent in charge of the White House detail, who was the planner of the Texas trip, Floyd Boring, to one of his assistants, a shift leader by the name of Emery Roberts, who was in charge of the follow-up car. You can see an agent, Henry Ribka, doing his normal duty, jogging besides the limousine, when in the follow-up car, you can see Emery Roberts stand up and wave him back, and you can see a very perplexed agent Ribka waving his arms in the air several times in seeming disgust. There was another last-minute change made at Love Field, invoked by the Secret Service. The Dallas Police Department motorcycle outriders were told not to be beside the car. It went from four to six down to a measly two riders on each side. And to add insult to injury, they were pushed further back in the motorcade by those agents not being by the car, by those motorcycle officers not being in a position. It opened up President Kennedy to a field of fire from in front and from the rear. In the months before the trip to Texas, there had been a growing number of threats against the president's life. Despite the increase in conspiratorial activity in the month of November 1963, in the apparent red alert the Secret Service appears to be under in response to this activity, the agency acts in the opposite fashion and actually reduces the security and acts like no threats on the president's life are occurring. Why? Uniquely on that day in Dallas, the press, the camera crews, Kennedy's military aide, who would normally sit in the front of the president's car, and even his personal physician, were all relegated to the rear of the motorcade by the Secret Service. In a conventional motorcade, the president would be somewhere in the middle, surrounded by security and the press. In this case, the presidential limousine was set right out in front of every other limousine, which of course is the reason why the Secret Service destroyed the records of its own motorcades when they were asked for them by the Assassination Records Review Board. The most suspicious behavior by shift leader Emery Roberts was to be at the time of the shooting in Dealey Plaza. Tragically, he actually ordered the agents not to move during the heart of the shooting. Agent Sam Kinney, who drove the fob car, admitted as much to me and told me, quote, exactly right, end quote. 
and all these deficiencies begin and end with the Secret Service because they were the prime movers. They were the ones who were directing the security arrangements from Washington up to and including in the heart of Dallas during security meetings. They were the ones that gave out assignments, vetoed or approved of security arrangements. So the buck stops with them. At Parkland Hospital after the president's death, the media were reporting that the fatal shots had come from in front of the presidential car. A press conference was conducted by Acting Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff at 1.30 after the president had been pronounced dead at 1 o'clock. Malcolm Kilduff explained that it had been a simple matter of a bullet right through the head while pointing to his right temple and attributing that finding to Admiral George Berkeley, who was the president's personal physician. This wound to the right temple and another wound to the throat three different times described as a wound of entry were widely broadcast on radio and television that afternoon. They were quickly suppressed because, of course, they contradicted the official government account, which was that three shots had been fired, all of them from above and behind. Connie Kritzberg was a reporter for the Dallas Times Herald on November 22, 1963. A couple of hours after the assassination, she did a phone interview with two of the principal doctors who had tended Kennedy. I talked to Dr. Kim Clark, who was head of neurosurgery at Parkland Hospital, and Dr. Malcolm Perry. So I asked, uh, how many wounds were there in the president? Uh, and I was told Dr. Kim Clark said, there was a gaping wound in the back of the head. And Dr. Perry said, uh, the wound I was working on was an entrance wound in the neck. And I asked him uh, where it was located. I asked him, was it below the Adam's apple? And he said, yes, it was in the midline, in the front of the neck, below the Adam's apple. And he said three times that it was an entrance wound from the front. And so I wrote a very simple story, uh, only about 12 inches long as we measured stories and uh, turned it in. The next morning, Connie found the story she filed had changed. I found in the story, in about the third paragraph, there had been a very unprofessional sentence inserted. It said, a doctor admitted there was possibly one wound. So I was very upset. I called the city desk and I talked to one of the assistant city editors that I, whom I respected quite a bit, and I said, who changed my story? Who put in that sentence? And he immediately knew what I was talking about. He said, the FBI. A story couldn't be printed that there was more than one shot and that one came from the front. It had to be altered, no matter how crudely, to conform to the official story that there were three shots from one place from one man, and it was only one man who committed the murder. Confirmation of what Connie was told by Dr. Perry comes from one of his colleagues who also attended the fatally wounded president at Parkland Hospital, the late Dr. Charles Crenshaw. Prior to the tracheostomy performed by uh, Dr. Perry, I observed in the lower third of the neck a small, rounded, well-demarcated entrance wound. This was obliterated by the tracheostomy in that Dr. Perry made the tracheostomy incision through the entrance wound. Different parts of the tissues were spread. He then made the incision into the trachea and through the hole that had previously been made by the entrance uh, of the bullet the tracheostomy was put in place. Radio reports from Dallas that afternoon mentioned the small round wound of entry in the front of the president's neck. They were heard by the late Dr. Robert Livingston, who was then scientific director of the National Institute for Mental Health. The reports had been that uh, the president had been shot from the rear, from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building and uh, the evidence at hand from the Parkland Hospital doctors of a small neat wound in the neck was contradictory to that or at least uh, complementary to that in the sense that 
it required that there be a shot from in front so that if he were shot from the rear, he was also being shot at at the same time from in front. So I wanted to tell whoever was going to do the autopsy about that. And so I telephoned Bethesda Naval Hospital. The officer of the day uh, I knew, and uh, he put me quickly through to Dr. James Humes, who was going to head the autopsy team. He was very cordial, and uh, we had a good conversation, brief. Uh, he had not heard about the neck wound. Uh, I told him that it was important because it was a wound of entrance, and I told him that it should be explored completely for its track and uh, to find any bullet or fragments of bullets that would remain, and uh, particularly emphasized that it had to be a frontal wound since there was no tearing of the tissues. He left the telephone momentarily and came back and said, Dr. Livingston, I'm sorry, I can't continue this conversation. The FBI won't let me. Humes later claimed he only learned about that bullet wound after the autopsy from one of the Dallas doctors. He never examined it. I'm absolutely certain about that telephone call. I'm sure that Dr. Humes uh, got a clear uh, impression from me about the neck wound representing a wound of entrance. Further corroboration of a shot fired from in front of Kennedy's car came from the late Dr. Evalia Glanges in her only filmed interview. She was no stranger to guns. I've been handling a gun since I was a child. Couldn't even hold a gun. I had to put it on the fence in order to shoot it. Paul! On the morning of November the 22nd, 1963, I was a second year medical student at Southwestern Medical University in Dallas, Texas. We ran around the side of the building to the emergency room exit, and the presidential limousine was there. Had been standing there for some time just watching the back of the emergency room when I realized that there was a bullet hole in the windshield. I talked to my friend next to me and said, look, there's a bullet hole in the windshield, and pointed it out to them. At the time, I did not know any of the details of the, of the shooting. I was quite shocked when I looked up and saw the bullet hole, but it was very clear. It was a through and through bullet hole through the windshield of the car from the front to the back. I don't believe there's any, even any cracks associated with that bullet hole. It seemed like a high velocity bullet that had penetrated from front to back in that glass pane. At which point a security officer of some type raced forward and jumped in the limousine and drove it off even as I was leaning against it to an area uh, back of us somewhere. And that was the last time I saw the limousine. The Secret Service made certain no authority in Dallas had an opportunity to examine the bullet damage to Kennedy's car. The Secret Service also usurped Dallas authority and removed the Kennedy limousine from Parkland Hospital and flew that limousine back to Washington, D.C. For over a decade, researcher Doug Weldon, a professor of criminal justice and an attorney, has studied Kennedy's limousine and what happened to it in the hours after the assassination. Just as the president's body in an autopsy could have given us many answers, a thorough study of that limousine at that time without evidence being tampered with would also have given us many important answers as to what really happened. But on arrival in Washington, damage to the limousine was noted. Charles Taylor Jr., the Secret Service agent who had accompanied Samuel Kinney in driving the vehicle to the White House garage from Andrews Air Force Base, noted in his report that of particular significance, just left to center of the windshield was a small hole from which it appeared that bullet fragments had been removed. Nick Prentzpey, a uh, United States police park officer also had an opportunity to take a look at the vehicle while it was in the White House garage. He noted that there was a small hole in the windshield and based upon his many years of experience as a police officer, he noted that that hole had been caused by a bullet. Over the ensuing days, the car was scrutinized in the White House garage by a number of people. But one day was different. 
If one examines the White House garage logs, it is very interesting that in the late evening of November 24th, 1963, and the entire day of November 25th, 1963, not one person is listed as having come in to the White House garage to have any contact with the limousine. Rumors circulated at the time, always denied, that the presidential car was secretly flown from Washington to the Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan, for the removal of its damaged windshield. It is very clear that the only mode of transportation that could have been used to transport the limousine from Washington, D.C. to the Dearborn plant would have been via airplane. There are several airports in the Detroit area. It would have been a simple matter to transport the limousine under cover to its final destination, the Ford Motor Company's Rouge plant. The late George Whitaker Sr., seen here with his wife, was a lifetime employee with Ford and held a managerial position at the Rouge plant. He went to work on the morning of November 25th to be confronted by an amazing sight. He was astonished when he went to the B building where the garage existed at that time and he saw the Kennedy limousine that John F. Kennedy had been murdered in. The interior of the limousine had completely been stripped and the windshield was not in the limousine. He went to the glass lab where he was in charge of laminating glass and the glass lab door was locked. He knocked on the door and it was open and two of his subordinates were in there with the windshield that had been removed from the vehicle. They were under orders to take that windshield and use it as a template in making a new windshield. But what fascinated him, and which he discussed with his family and no one else until he spoke with me, was that he saw a hole in the windshield. It was a good, clean bullet hole right straight through on the front. Right. This had a clean round hole in the front and fragmentized the front of that. Mr. Whitaker had 30 years of experience working with glass and had seen many tests performed on glass, including tests performed with firearms. He described that hole as being in the same location that Charles Taylor Jr. of the Secret Service had described the hole in his report. And of course, without knowing that anybody had observed it before then, but he also was absolutely 100% convinced that that shot had to emanate from the front of the Kennedy limousine thus indicating that a shot had been fired from the front to his mind to 100% certainty. I asked him what had happened to the original windshield. His answer to me was, we scrapped it. I said, you destroyed it? And he says, that's right. Our orders were to destroy, to scrap that windshield. After George Whitaker died in 2001, this statement was found amongst his possessions, reaffirming for future generations exactly what he had told Doug Weldon eight years previously. This document was discovered, and for me, it gave the final stamp of approval that what he told me on that August day in 1993 was in fact the truth of what really happened. One of the assassination's most significant smoking guns, indicating both a conspiracy and a cover-up, is kept here. Kennedy's original autopsy photographs, taken at Bethesda Hospital on the night of his death, have always been used to support the lone gunman theory. I've looked at these autopsy photographs at the National Archives on many occasions now. I've actually been there on nine separate visits. When the photographs of the back of the head at the autopsy were shown to 16 Parkland doctors. All 16 said they did not recognize that photograph as what they had seen in the emergency room at Parkland Hospital. How many people did recognize it? Zero. When I went to the archives to look at these photographs of the back of the head, there's a pair of photographs, so I used the stereo viewer. And what I saw was really quite shocking. This whole area of hair on the back of the head, with the hair standing up, 
looked as if it had been glued in one particular plane in space. It was two-dimensional, whereas the rest of the photograph is three-dimensional. And the 3D effect occurs for virtually all the other pairs of photographs, so this was unique. The back of the head, this area, and the hair sticking up here looked as though it was simply two-dimensional, as if it had been glued into one position in space in one plane. It was the most bizarre. What does that mean? Photographic forgery. We get a 3D effect for all the image except for the place where it's exactly the same because it's been dubbed in. So they took out basically the park where the hole was and instead they, they used a soft mat insert to put in the same image on each of these uh, photos of the back of the head so that it would look like there was no damage back here. If there's a big hole at the right rear of the head, that means a shot from the front. That can't be Oswald. So the conspirators were hard pressed at this point. They had to get rid of that big hole at the back of the head or it would have clearly shown shots from the front and no possibility of a lone gunman. Remarkable testimony regarding the autopsy photographs comes for the first time from veteran World War II photographer Joe O'Donnell. He worked for the State Department and then the US Information Agency for a total of 23 years serving with distinction under six presidents. He was devastated by Kennedy's death. He was a fine man, he really was. And I hate to say it, but I really loved him. I really did. Wonderful person. A close colleague of Joe's for many years was the late Robert Knudsen, a Navy photographer who was permanently attached to the White House. He didn't have many friends, not in the press. They were envious of him. But he was a very nice fellow. We always got along great. On the night of Kennedy's assassination, Robert Knudsen never came home. He returned to his family three days later, deeply disturbed. He told them he had taken many photographs of the president's body in the morgue at Bethesda, and that it was the hardest assignment he'd ever had. He said the Secret Service had controlled all of the film. A few days after the assassination, I was at the White House in the press room and Knudsen came to me and he said, uh, Joe, I have something I want to show you. So I went back to his sort of a work room and uh, he pulled out an envelope and showed me about 12 pictures, five by seven, and had all these pictures of the president on his stomach and on his back and could see the hole here, about three eighths of an inch. and the back of his head above the, the line, big hole about the size of a grapefruit. And then a couple of days later, maybe a day later, he said, Joe, have a minute? And I said, sure. I said, I want to show you something. Those pictures I showed you the other day, these are the same ones, but a little different. And I said, what do you mean? He said, let me show you. He got the first one out, and I said, no hole. He said, no, they covered it up. And I looked in the back. The hole was neatly covered up. And I said, who did that? He said, well, I didn't do it. I said, well, I'm not saying you did, but I'm surprised. There is no record of Robert Knudsen attending Kennedy's autopsy. Yet, he had photographs in his possession that had clearly been altered to disguise a shot from the front. These photographs were always in the control of the Secret Service. So whoever, whoever changed this, whoever modified it, either had to be in the government or had to have the approval of the government to do this. Um, we certainly can't imagine the Mafia, for example, doing this or the Soviets. There's just no way. It had to be someone with uh, government approval. The government continues to be haunted by the discrepancy between the wounds the autopsy photographs show and what the Dallas doctors actually saw. In the late 70s, the House Select Committee on Assassinations looked at the evidence of the Kennedy assassination. Uh, and one of the most disturbing things uh, about that evidence when they looked at it was the fact that there were a team of doctors where Kennedy had been taken right after he was shot in Dallas. These are Dallas doctors who were experienced in trauma who had said he had a hole in the back of his head. The House Select Committee on Assassinations was trying to say that Oswald had done it, and with a hole in the back of the head, if you're being shot in the back and the, and the, the bullet blowing out in front, that doesn't fit. 
So the House Select Committee reported that it had refuted the Dallas doctors. The Dallas doctors had all got it wrong because they had better witnesses. Their witnesses were the witnesses that were uh, there in the morgue during the autopsy. And they said that 26 witnesses that they'd interviewed all endorsed the autopsy photographs showing the head wound up here. None of them agreed that there was a wound back here. There is no medical evidence that President Kennedy was hit from the front and to the right. But they didn't let us see the interviews. They didn't let us see the documents that these people had prepared. In fact, they were scheduled to have been suppressed until 2028. When the documents tumbled out in the mid-1990s, lo and behold, the autopsy witnesses, who the House Select Committee had interviewed, said the same thing the Dallas doctors did. The hole in the head was back here. They drew diagrams showing a hole in the head back here or back here. And it became very apparent that the House Select Committee had just interviewed these people, suppressed their testimonies, and then misrepresented them in their report. The forensic pathological panel simply says that if he was shot out from the front and to the right, the shot missed. The doctors who were supposed to evaluate the medical evidence for the House Select Committee assassinations never saw these suppressed interviews where not only were the, the Dallas doctors saying there's a hole in the back of the head here, but so were the morgue witnesses saying there was a hole in the back of the head. So it was a complete abomination. It was uh, perhaps the most dishonest thing that was ever done, and it was apparently done to keep Oswald as the central figure in this scenario. As the cover-up of Kennedy's murder slowly unravels and the true picture unfolds, new smoking guns are revealed. This is the field of honor in Restland Cemetery, Dallas, and the burial site of a professional mortician laid to rest here by his colleagues on February 17, 1974. This plaque marks the life of a mysterious man whose links to the Kennedy assassination are only just beginning to emerge. His name was John Liggett. He is remembered as a highly skilled embalmer by a former friend and co-worker, Charles Smith. If he'd have to build a lip or a nose or build an eye orbit or an ear, he may work all night long doing the reconstructive work on someone that had been maybe shot in the face or automobile accident. He was the best. He would tell you he was the best. And when he finished it, he wanted the family to tell him he was the best. Popular with his colleagues, he also had a secret life. There'd be days when John would call and say, I need to miss tonight, or I'm not going to be there. Or, this happened quite a bit that John was, we didn't know where John was, and I don't know that management knew where he was. He would just call in and say, I need off. Never discussed where he was. And we didn't ask. A lot of fellow workers would wonder, why can he be gone two or three weeks, come right back in so easy? And we felt like if we were gone for two or three weeks, so there was no use to coming back. In a small town in Oklahoma, far from the rhythms of the big city, John Liggett is remembered by a former wife. Lois married him in Dallas after a whirlwind romance only three months before Kennedy's assassination. John was a very charming person, and I found him to be very attentive and considerate and very, very sweet to me. I loved him. I fell in love with him. John came into our lives less than a year after our own father, Charles Godwin, had been killed in a private plane crash. And uh, John was not real welcome by my two older sisters and my, my brother and myself. We were a family. And he had a ready-made cover. And that's what I've always thought is that we were a convenient cover for a man who needed, uh, needed that. On the day of the assassination, John was with Lois at Restland, attending the funeral service of her late aunt. He was suddenly called from the graveside. John went to the office and came back very shortly and explained to me that the President of the United States had been shot and that he was called to go to Parkland Hospital. I went home after the funeral and it was about two o'clock in the afternoon. And John called me from Parkland. I could hear the confusion in the background. And I asked him what was going on. He said, the president has died. And I said, well, did Restland get the job? And he said, no, some other funeral home got the job. 
but he said, I've got a lot of work to do. Don't try to call me. I'll call you as soon as I can. And it was about 24 hours before I heard from him. He came home and he walked in the door. And when I saw him, he physically looked like he had really been through a very traumatic experience. His clothes were disarrayed, and that was so out of character for him. He was obviously tired, very exhausted, but agitated and, and hyped, and informed my mother that we would be leaving town, that we had to get out of town. I said, where are we going? And he said, we're going to get out of town for a while until all of this blows over. And that was a quote, because I thought, well, what blows over? A high-speed journey south took the perplexed family firstly to Austin and then San Antonio. John made brief stops en route to have huddled conversations with various contacts. Throughout this journey, there were conversations that went on between John and his relatives and friends that I did not feel like I was privy to. That they were, they knew something I didn't know and I didn't understand what was going on. In the early hours of Sunday morning, November 24th, the family finally checked into a motel near Corpus Christi. John had a further meeting this time with his elder brother, Malcolm. Here again, they had conversations that made me feel like I didn't belong, that they knew something I didn't know. I don't know why we were there, but it seemed to be very important to John that we were there. I do recall that every time I would see John in the room there, he was seated on the end of the bed watching the television and very intently watching the news and chain smoking because he did chain smoke and was, uh, when John was nervous, he had a little bit of a nervous tick in his cheek, which I always knew that was, that he was a little nervous there. That's when he saw Oswald killed by Jack Ruby. He's been shot, he's been shot. Eddie Oswald has been shot. And the minute he saw that, he looked at me and said, Everything's okay now, and you could just see his face. He was like all the pressure had been taken off of him. All of a sudden, he was like, sigh of relief, let's go, we can go home now. It was basically, pack your things, come on, we're leaving, you know, now we can go. We went back to D Dallas, and everything went back to normal as normal as if everything could be under those conditions of the president's death. But their lifestyle changed. After the assassination, John seemed to come into a lot of money. The family moved into a luxury home and Liggett became a big time gambler, hosting some of the wildest poker parties in Dallas. The whole lifestyle from the moment John Kennedy was shot was just one chaotic thing after another. Either the police were involved in something he was doing or his gambling was involved in something he was doing. It was just way over my head. The company he kept, the people, the pressure, it was just more than I could take. There was an occasion that my sister Benny and my mother both recall uh, of a visit from one of John's rather eccentric friends from New Orleans. And he was a rather freakish character. And my sister claims that we made merciless fun of him, the kids, my brother, my sisters, um, because he was rather odd with the painted on eyebrows and the wig. He was a rather freakish man. John said to us that this was a friend of his from the Civil Air Patrol, that they had been in Civil Air Patrol together. And we believe this was David Ferry. David Ferry was a prime suspect in the 1967 Garrison investigation into Kennedy's assassination. He was found dead in his New Orleans apartment before he could be interrogated. 
I really believe that John Liggett was somehow involved in the John F. Kennedy assassination. I think his role was to do something with the body. To the body, how alter it, fix it, I have no idea. Now, he may have even gone with it to Bethesda. He had plenty of time to do that. I think his job was to do something with that body of John F. Kennedy. Liggett's lifestyle led Lois to divorce him in 1966. They both remarried, but remained close. In 1974, out of the blue, Liggett was arrested for attempted murder. This Dallas home was the scene of a vicious crime. Dorothy Peck, a friend of John Liggett's, suffered horrendous injuries and was left for dead, but survived to identify Liggett as her assailant. The police were swiftly linking him with other brutal killings in the Dallas area. He was imprisoned in the county jail, but the police were not allowed to interrogate him. John had been held on remand for almost a year when his brother Malcolm insisted on meeting Lois in a park in Austin. He was very secretive about this meeting, and he wanted to walk. He wouldn't talk to me in my car. And he told me at that time not to have any further contact with John, that it would be in my best interest not to. In fact, he said, if you care anything at all about your children, or yourself, you will not see him or correspond with him anymore. And I think that Malcolm felt that if I talked to John, John would tell me something that either Malcolm or someone Malcolm knows didn't want John to tell me. And I really believed that. I was so frightened by this action that I moved to Lubbock, Texas. And a few weeks later, I had a phone call from a friend there who told me that John had been shot in the back and was dead. On the morning of February the 14th, 1975, Liggett was being transferred with other prisoners from the courthouse in downtown Dallas to the nearby county jail. The police vehicle had entered the garage when Liggett, using a hidden key, slipped out of his handcuffs and made a bid for freedom. A single shot in the back, fired by a sheriff's deputy, killed him instantly. I feel like Malcolm knew that there was something that was going to happen. I feel that he knew more than he was saying to me. and it frightened me for myself and for my children. But the mysteries do not end with Liggett's death. In 1992, Deborah, for the first time, met Leona, John's wife at the time he died. Although reluctant to talk, Leona recounted a visit to Restland to view Liggett's body prior to burial. She came out from East Texas to Dallas and she was shocked and surprised because to her, this was not John, it wasn't John there. She said that the person that was in the casket that she was shown had a mustache. And this to her was also an indication this was not John. And, and I too would have to think not because John never, as long as I'd known him for the many, many years, could, could even grow a mustache. <laughs> I did get the distinct impression that Leona was very nervous, even at that time in 1992, to speak with me about the details of John's death and her suspicions that it was not John that was buried there, and probably rightly so. I think I would be very nervous to, to know that as well, and I think I am. <laughs> John's brother, Malcolm, handled the funeral that took place three days after the shooting. John's former colleague, Charles Smith, was there. There's no doubt the person that, that we handled the funeral for, the person that we embalmed, the person that I helped dress and we put in the casket and, and handled the funeral service for, 
That was John Melvin Liggett. That was a John Liggett that we knew for several years prior to this incident happening. But the story does not end there. After his divorce from Lois, John worked in Las Vegas for three years as a dealer. He had close contacts there. Recently, Lois was on vacation in Vegas with her grandchildren when she had the most extraordinary experience. We were in a casino, and I saw someone that looked exactly like John Liggett. And he turned around and looked at me and heard me call one of my grandchildren's names. And when I did, he looked at her and he looked back toward one of the people that worked with him, turning his back to me, and said something to him about me because he pointed back of himself toward me. But we didn't stay around to find out if that was John or not. I was pretty shaken by it. I really felt like from the back of his head, and when he turned around and faced me, I thought it was John Liggett. So it wouldn't surprise me a bit in the world if he were in Vegas. In fact, that's the most logical place I can think of that he would be. Lois and Deborah's suspicions about John Liggett's ties to the assassination are reinforced by a photograph that has emerged in recent times. It was taken at Jack Ruby's Dallas nightclub, The Carousel, prior to the assassination and Ruby's shooting of Oswald. Obviously, one would recognize Jack Ruby. Uh, immediately to his right is John Liggett's brother, Malcolm Liggett. Uh, his wife, Suzanne, the blonde, to his right. We met her several occasions that she was at our home. The last I recall seeing Malcolm Liggett was at my mother's residence in Dallas. And this was in the, at the time that John was still in jail in Dallas. The woman with the dark hair and the black dress in the center of the photograph is Iris Campbell. Not at the time of this photograph, but years later, my mother met Iris when they were living in West Texas out in Lubbock. Uh, my mother was a member of the Episcopal Church, uh, St. Paul's there in Lubbock. And Iris came in one day and had expressed an interest in becoming an Episcopalian and joining the church. And she and my mother became very dear friends and later also became my daughter's godmother. For a few years there, she was in and out in, in close contact with my mother, came and visited frequently, and then disappeared, basically just disappeared. And uh, I've not seen Iris Campbell, and neither has my mother for many, many years. She just kind of faded out. Prior to seeing this photograph, uh, I was unaware of any connection between the people that I do know and Jack Ruby. And it does put them in context then as acquaintances of Jack Ruby's. I really think that maybe John had something to do with government business. I really believe his death had something to do with the John F. Kennedy connection. What exactly? I don't know, but I believe it. Much may still remain obscure, and many questions wait an answer. But as more and more courageous Americans speak out, the smoke begins to clear, revealing the hidden truth that lies behind the assassination of President John F. Kennedy.